Welcome everyone to our webinar on business and trade records. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge country. In the spirit of reconciliation, New South Wales State Archives acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. So what are we planning to look at today? We're going to look at locating business and trade records in state archives and a wide range of sources, such as the 1828 census, colonial secretary's papers, land records, court records, insolvency bankruptcies, probates deceased estates, and then we're going to have a look specifically at records that were created by the New South Wales government about companies. And I want to emphasise that there is a lot of information about business and trade in, if you like, registers that records that weren't specifically created to regulate companies, records that are about people, because people are very much involved in business and trade. The main thing to remember is that New South Wales State Archive records the role of government in New South Wales and its dealings with the people of New South Wales from 1788 onwards. So the records are arranged by the government agency that created them. They're not necessarily indexed by the name of people. And they exist purely because government was interested or involved in a particular business or trade. And the amount of information that you'll get really depends upon that amount of involvement that the government had. Often the government was involved because there was a need to regulate the trade for health or other reasons. But for most records, the information that they have in, on about a business was not the reason that the records were created. It's a byproduct. The most important question you need to ask when using any archives is why were these records created? And often the answer to that is a piece of legislation. And why were they seen as important enough to be kept as archives? So we're going to start out with the 1828 census. It was created to record all the people in the colony, except for the military and their families. And it was the appointed collectors went around and got the information from people from each household in a territory that was allotted to them. There are 36,500 people. It includes both Moreton Bay and Norfolk Island. The 1828 census has, has been published in a variety of formats. So there's the book, there's the CD, and the advantage of the CD is it can be searched by any one of the 12 fields. And one of those fields is occupation. It's also, the 1828 census is also digitized and indexed on ancestry.com and it can be browsed digitally on our website. What were the occupations of some of those 36 and a half thousand people? There were bakers, blacksmiths, brewers, brickmakers, butchers, carpenters, coopers, dealers, innkeepers, merchants, publicans, shopkeepers, almost as many tailors as there were blacksmiths, over 6,000 labourers, over 2,000 servants and 800 odd shepherds. One quack doctor, Walter Boston, one tinker, William Cook, and this does worry me for the sanitary conditions of the original colony, one plumber, John Croker. He must have been a very busy person. Now, if you're using the CD-ROM, as we said, you can search by occupation. And here we have a reference to Reuben Uther, who is a hatter. And in the 1828 census, he's one of only 10 hatters in the colony. When we combine the census with colonial secretary's letters, we get a more information on Reuben's occupation and his manufactory. So in 1836, he wrote to Governor Burke asking if he could have more convicts assigned. In the letter, he states that he's had a manufactory since 1812 in the colony, and he produces between 5,000 and 6,000 hats annually. 
and he has employed anywhere from eight to 14 convicts at one time as hatters. And these were generally people who already had that profession when they arrived in the colony. In the 1828 census, we also have John Mazagora and his occupation in the census is dealer in curiosities. But in his probate record, he's described as a bird stuffer. And from the probate record, there you can see the word bird stuffer on his occupation. We learn that he has recently died on the 24th of October and that his wife and four children survive. But then his wife has also recently died. She died in February. And this is now the, the estate has to be administered for those four children. And we have an ad from the Sydney Morning Herald talking about what is actually up for sale in March 1838. A unique collection of live and stuffed birds, skins, scarce and valuable shells, natural curiosities, paddles, clubs, spears. Now the correspondence of the colonial secretary is one of the most valuable source of information we have, primarily because he was the main public servant in New South Wales at the time, and also because the records have survived. The bulk of the records created between 1788 and 1825 have been indexed on our website. And they've, our website includes subjects as well as occupations. The records are also digitised and indexed by personal name on Ancestry.com. So here are some examples from the index that's on our website and you can see the names of the merchants there, quite a few of them. You can also see references to trade generally. Now one of the occupations, trades if you like, that was heavily regulated right from the beginning is the sale of alcohol and the brewing of alcohol. So lots and lots of references to hotels and licensing them. Here, for example, we have a copy of the public notice listing publicans licensed to sell wine and spirits and also persons licensed to, do, to brew beer for 1816. So we have a number of names there, up to 50 people for Sydney. Parramatta and other pages also cover Windsor and the Hawkesbury. We also have references by companies such as the Lachlan and Watermill Mill Company. And here again, we have Reuben Uther, who arrived in 1807 and is a juror at, on various inquests is able to receive land, is a foreman of a juror, uh, desires in 1822 to apprentice a boy from the male orphan institution for presumably for his business and by 1823 is on a list of people to whom convicts have been assigned. Another very valuable resource for that early time period is the register of assignments and other legal instruments which covers 1794 to 1824. The nine volume of registers are known as the old register and it's available on DVD. It was proclaimed in 1802 but it did allow people to actually register assignments and other legal instruments back to 1794. There's a very good index and also the DVD includes the copies of the originals. So for example, here's from the index, we can see that Reuben Uther in 1811 is entering into an agreement with Mrs. Messrs. Lord and Williams for five years to, to manufacture hats. And the idea is that there'll be three shares and this is spelt out better in the actual document. So there'll be three shares, he'll take one, Mr. Lord and Mr. Williams will each take another one and the profits will be shared between them. An obvious example of a very early company, even though that term may not have been used at the time. 
Court records are a very important method of looking at trades and businesses, uh, pro mostly when things go wrong. The bench of magistrates was convened in Sydney on the 19th of February 1788 and by the 1820s it's sitting at Parramatta and Hawkesbury and it's fairly heavily in use. Now there is an online index to the Sydney and Parramatta benches on our website and it does include regulations and licensing and other business activities. So here we have references to Edwin Robinson who is first of all in 1798 is listed as a surety on a list of licenses granted to sell liquor. By 1809 he has his own license, 1811 he's also able to sell wine and liquors. Court records, most a lot of court, early court records have been indexed but some of them have also been transcribed on the Macquarie University's website, Decisions of Superior Courts of New South Wales. Well worth a look at because it's also you can index it by any of the names involved. There were courts that handled small debts. These may morph over time and their name changes slightly, but the role is basically the same. So the Court of Civil Jurisdiction runs till 1814 and it involved land, houses, tenements, hereditaments, pleas of debts, contracts, etc, etc and it also had probate on wills. The Governor's Court is 1814 to 24 and again it does most of the same things although it doesn't have probates involved. And the Court of Requests takes over in 1823 to 58 and again it has debts where the matter doesn't exceed 10 pounds. Of course many of these court cases are also reported in the newspapers which are now available digitally on Trove. So here we have Isaac Payton suing Joseph Inch in 1810. And if we go to the actual record for that case, then we learn about, it's about some work that Inch did for Payton, for which he wanted to charge 36 pounds. Now Payton has only paid 25 to 26 pounds because he doesn't think the, worth, the work was worth that much money. And to support him he's called in Lewis Jones who's a master stonemason and has been one for 18 years and understands masonry work. And he says that the work that Inch did was not worth 36 pounds and it should only have been the 25 pounds. So there you've got information on three people, Isaac Payton, Joseph Inch and Lewis Jones. Of course sometimes businesses and trades can involve criminal cases. We do have criminal court records here at State Archives as well. There's the Court of Criminal Jurisdiction up to 1823 and after that you've got the Supreme Court. There are various indexes on our website. You can get to these either via the online indexes all indexes except the colonial secretaries 1788 to 1825 are also searchable via our main website using the collection search box. So here for example we've put in the name of Joseph Salter and we find out that he's actually been brought up before the courts in 1818 for uttering promissory notes purporting to be drawn on the Bank of New South Wales with intent to defraud. If we actually go to the Macquarie University's website, we have a transcript of the case taken from the Sydney Gazette. He's a well-known dealer in Sydney and not only did he pass some of the, these notes on to other people, but a great number of them were found upon his person concealed in both of his shoes. William Thorne, the constable, said that there were 35 notes from the Bank of New South Wales actually stuffed in Joseph Salter's shoes. The verdict was 
sentence of transportation for the term of seven years to Newcastle. Sometimes business goes bung. Insolvency and bankruptcy records, we hold those as well. And they're obviously all about debt, but sometimes that debt is because of business activities. And they're also about what assets the people hold. And again, often those assets will be related to the, their business or trade. There are guides on our website in the research A to Z section. And the important thing to remember if you're looking for bankruptcy is that in 1928, it was transferred to the Commonwealth Government. So we will have information on bankruptcies and insolvencies before 1928. But after 1928, you'll need to go to the National Archives of Australia. You can search via collection search or via the indexes. And with the indexes you, and also with collection search, you can combine words. You can look for people's names, but you can also look for occupations and you can look for localities. So here, for example, is a search done through collection search using the advanced option, asking for the word hairdresser and the word bankruptcy. And we get back a long list of people who were hairdressers who went bankrupt. We can do the same search through the online indexes. So here, because it is just the bankruptcy index, we've only had to enter the word hairdresser to find those people. But the advantage with the online indexes is that you can then copy, print, or more importantly, you can download it as an Excel, the, the entries that you found, or as a CSV if you want to use them in a database so that you can rearrange them yourself by date, by place, and so on and so forth. And here we have two examples from insolvencies. The first one is an inventory of the goods of Charles Adams of Clyde Street, Sydney, who is a publican and therefore has a counter, tables, bottles of soda water, bottles of wine, various, etc., etc. On the other side, we have the inventory of goods of Jabez Young of Bathurst, who is a hairdresser and perfumer in 1866. So he has shampoo, he has show tickets, he has bottles of scent, he has pomade, volunteer cups, and so on and so forth. Now, a lot of our records that we have here relate to the property and assets of a deceased person and how they were disposed of. These include deceased estate records, which were created for the payment of death duty, they include probate records, which obviously include the wills. We also have records of cu the curator of intestate estates as well, where people died without leaving a will and they're trying to find a relative to whom those, that property should pass on. With the probate records, there are the early probate records, there are the probate packets, which cover from 1817 to 1976 is held here and part of 1989. And there are the will books. The will books are actually a clerk's copy of the will and they're also available on Find My Past. You can search by personal name using the collection search on our website. However, probates from 1890 to 1913 and 1920 to 1928, and 1977 to 1985, you'll need to check the probate index on Microfish to find the numbers of those. We do have the wills for 19, 1890 to 1913, sorry, the probate packets, I should say, from 1890 to 1913, and from 1920 to 28. They're just not listed on our website at the moment. Deceased estate files are probably more interesting in terms of trade and business. And you can find those. First of all, check the probate index. Generally, if people left a will, they'll also have a deceased estate file. 
also check collection search because deceased estates to circa 1930 are listed on our collection search. But for those after 1930, you may need to check the microfilm copies of the deceased estate index, which is available in our reading room and which is also available digitally and has been indexed on Ancestry.com. This is searchable only under the name of the deceased. Here we have some lovely examples from deceased estate files. Now, because you had to pay a percentage of your estate to the stamp duties office, death duties, inheritance tax, whatever you'd like to call it, they did require a very itemised list of what was in your estate. So here we have Anthony Wenby, who died in 1944, and he was a gross, a storekeeper, sorry, at Braidwood. We learned that he had 21 dozen bottles of tomato sauce. He had castor oil. He had flour. He had coffee essence, 20 dozen bottles of coffee essence, custard powder, two and a quarter dozen Holbrook sauce bottles, soap, biscuits, borax, barley, wheat, vinegar, two different sorts, Cornwalls and Champions, methylated spirits, kerosene, and Rinso and Lifebuoy and Lux. And of course, we also learn the prices of those items. Here, for example, we have Charles Pryor Keeble, who was formerly of Bellingen and Bondi, but was lately living at Randwick. He was a retired storekeeper who died in 1932. So for him, we don't have a list of items because he no longer had the store, but we do find out that he retired as a storekeeper at Bellingen about 19 years ago. And until six years ago, he was a manager at various other stores. And we also find out he had no assets when he died that related to his storekeeping period because he had not carried on that occupation for over six or seven years prior to his death. And that the property at Bellingen that he had was leased firstly to someone called Winter and then to someone called Halpin. Now, there are other kind of occupations that the government was involved in licensing. One of these, for example, via the Courts of Petty Sessions was hawkers and also stage carriage licenses. So here we have that Samuel Lees has been licensed at Parks in 1915 to be a hawker travelling on foot. And we have four stage carriages, William Gooley, Arthur George Davis, Arthur George Davis again, and Ellen Davis. So maybe the Davises have a family business and are all licensed to be stage carriages. Here we have a Bathurst register. And whilst Joseph Stain is licensed to be a hawker and is allowed the use of a horse and cart, Mary Gray is only allowed to be a, haw a hawker walking around on foot. Obviously, another occupation that the government was very interested in is hotels and the issue of publicans and other licenses. So we have butts of publicans licenses from 1830. We have certificates of publicans license 1853 to 61. But the main source of information about hotels, publicans licenses, wine and other spirit licenses is the New South Wales Government Gazettes from 1866 to 1922. And of course, the New South Wales Government Gazettes are available on Trove. There is also a card index to publicans licences from 1920 to 37, which was under the heading of the Agency Licences Reduction Board. And the Licences Reduction Board also has files re-terminated publicans licences from 1920 to 1943. So here we see one of those early butts of certificates of publicans licences from 1838 
or David Brown at Patterson. And one of the beautiful hotel plans, which you'll be hearing more about in another web mini webinar, this one being for the Hotel International Bondi. Another area that the government had licensing over and was interested in was, of course, theatres. So we have files relating to the licensing of theatres and public halls. And we also have files from the Board of Fire Commissioners, files from the Board of Fire Commissioners about the inspection of theatres and public halls in the country districts. Now, the reason for this, it has to do with whether or not they're safe for fire. Can, are they likely to burn down? Can people escape from them easily? So we do have lots of files relating to theatres and public halls, and you can search for these on our collection search using the name, either the locality or the name of the actual hall. So here we have a letter from the Patterson Police on the 14th of February 1938, saying that they've gone and talked to Leonard James Rose of Patterson Pictures about his licensing and that he shows pictures once a week during the past six months. And they also use the building for socials and school children's functions and card parties. Speaking of fires, we do have lots of information about fires. For example, there is what's called a list of important fires for the Sydney district, 1840 to 69. There are newspaper cuttings, there are files on major fires. And of course, fires would get an inquest, whether or not there was someone killed in them or not. So if you actually look up at the inquest registers, which we have here on microfilm, or are also digitized on Ancestry, you will find references to fires in those as well. Now we're going to talk about some of the actual company type records, business type records that are held in the state archives. And I just want to emphasize the fact that these records start generally because there's an act of parliament or regulations that are put through by the parliament. So before 1874, the only way to create a company was in fact to have a Act of Parliament passed. After 1874, then you can finally create companies separately from without having to create Acts of Parliament. And that's when a lot of our company records actually start. There is also the Registration of Firms Act, 1902. And this started from the 1st of January, 1903. And what it meant is if you had a firm that was trading under a name that was not the full or usual names of the people who were carrying out the business, in other words, it was a trade name, then you had to actually be registered. This means, of course, that the register doesn't include every firm in New South Wales. It only includes the ones that had a name that was different from the name of the proprietor. If you are interested in the legislation, it can all be found on the New South Wales legislation website. So here, for example, is an entry from the Register of Companies, which starts in 1874, and is for the Hygienic Jam Company. And we learn that it is registered offices are in Hay Street, Leichhardt, and then they later moved to Darlington, and the first date of registration was the 15th of June, 1933, with a capital of 5,000 pounds. And we also get the company's registration number. We also have memorandums and articles of association of companies. And these are really good packets because they do have masses of information about a company. But it's not every company that was formed in New South Wales. It's only companies that were involved with the Registrar General of Titles in relation to land dealings. Because the Registrar General had to determine whether or not if they were dealing in land held under Torrens title. So again, it's not all land, it's only land under Torrens title. They had to determine whether or not they were allowed to trade in land, allowed to 
have dealings in land according to their their rules and therefore the registrar general required unincorporated bodies to lodge their rules and incorporated bodies to lodge their memoranda and articles of association to show that they actually had the right to deal in land. So it contains information on a variety of bodies throughout Australia, New Zealand, the United Kingdom that were involved in banking and investment, land acquisition and development, life insurance and mining. But it's not just companies. It's also building societies, friendly societies, unions, religious bodies, charities, clubs, education institutions, ex-servicemen's association and professional bodies. And it's a great series for those of you who are doing local history. Now they're all listed on our website under the name of the company. So here we have the Memorandum of Association of Hudson's Euthymnol Chemical Company. And it includes the names of the subscribers, George Inglis Hudson, who is the manufacturing chemist, Mary Louisa Hudson, married woman, I wonder if she's his wife, Mary Ann Hudson, widow, again, possibly mother, and Henry James Hudson, who is the bookkeeper, suspecting possibly some relation, having the name Hudson. And it was 1908 that it was incorporated. And here we have the Hygienic Jam Company Limited again, their memorandum and articles of association. Starting off in 1933. Now we have the register of firms from 1903 to 1922. And this was created under the Registration of Firms Act 1902. It records the name of the firm, the nature of the business, packet number, place of business, statement number, date of registration. And the most important thing is the details of persons carrying on the business. Now, these registers are indexed on our website and can be searched via collection search for the names of the firm and the names of the people in the business. However, it's important to remember that there are no packets surviving for these firms. So basically it is a register which has minimum information. So here we have some examples. Mrs. Bobrowski, who have a general store at Bathurst. And whilst it includes only the names of Amelia and Jane, we actually do get some further information because although it was registered initially in 1903, Jane shortly died shortly thereafter. And we get a reference to that. And the registration was cancelled in 1936. Here we have also C. Kwong Hai, storekeeper at Vaniloquin, registered in 1909. And we get the names of the two parties. Ching Kong and Wei Long. And we also have Norton and Rowlandson, who are builders and contracts at Baraba, who are registered in 1909. Again, the main point of this is that they're not using their full name as their firm name. So even though it's Mrs. Bobrowski, because they didn't say Jane Bobrowski or Amelia Bobrowski, they had to be registered. We also have company's office records. And again, it's important to remember these are companies registered after 1875, but who have ceased trading by 1977. In other words, these are dead companies. So if you're after information on a company that's still trading, our records won't help you. So there's a couple of different series of this. There are the documents lodged under the Companies Act, 1875. Documents lodged under the Companies Act for No Liability Mining Companies, 1880, and documents lodged under the Companies Act for Foreign Companies in 1907. There's a packet for each company full of lovely detail, and they're indexed on our available, the names are available through collection search. So here, for example, we have the packet for J. Hyman Furs Proprietary Limited, 
It's number 17516. And it tells you the documents that are inside that packet. And here are some samples of the kind of documents that are inside. So the first one is whether or not a search memo to show whether or not anybody has already used that name as a business name under the Business Names Act 1934. Then we have a copy of the Memorandums Association of J. Hyman Fur Proprietary Limited under the Companies Act 1936. And the name was registered for in 1937. We have a reference to the fact that the company did not function during World War II and only resumed trading in 1946. And the direct has the director's names. And then we have a reference from 1950 to say that they had decided to close down and to wind up the company. New South Wales State Archives also has photographs, but you could also check the State Library of New South Wales' website and of course also the pictures on Trove. Now we don't specifically have photographs of individual businesses, but often because we have streetscapes that are taken for other reasons, it may in fact show businesses. So this one is from the Sydney Improvement Board. And they've actually taken it as an example to show how badly the, sh the streets are looking, how the awnings and the verandas and the sign boards are cluttering up the street. But because they've taken it, we get to know about E.R. Cole Bookseller, that he was selling charts and nautical bookshops, mechanical and engineering books, medical and scientific books, English and American magazines, charts and nautical books, and so on and so forth. We learned that the gift depot has fancy goods and that there is a milliner shop there as well. Another example from the Sydney Improvement Board, again to show the variety of unsightly and unsuitable verandas, awnings and signboards in King Street, Sydney near George Street. But again, we get to know that Brame and Much are tailors and outfitters. And that Myers and Sons are tobacconists. And that we've even got a sign writer in the same street. And a more recent shot again. No veranda poles here, but still lots of signage to tell us what businesses were in what part of town. Plus lots of traffic. The next two photographs are taken from the Department of Main Roads photographs and they have to do with the building of roads. But incidentally, they also capture buildings and businesses alongside the road. And here we can see one of the surveyors obviously doing his work to look at what the road improvements are needed. But we've also got the tobacconist and hairdressers further down the street. And this one is a nice close up of Sugden's hairdressers and tobacconists in Parramatta Road with the proprietors standing out the front of the building. There are other sources, some of which we may hold copies of and which may also be available in other libraries that can also help you find your trade or profession or company. The Directory of Sydney 1844 the Sydney Commercial Directory 1851. Telephone directories are available at large libraries such as State Library of New South Wales. Local government records. For example, the City of Sydney Archives has assessment books and council minutes. And of course, there's also SANS directory, which covers Sydney, particularly from the 1860s and from the 1890s can also cover country towns. It has been digitised and indexed on Ancestry.com and there are also digital copies available from the City of Sydney Archives website. It has a alphabetical listing of people. It has a listing by 
trades and profession, professions. So here we see the hairdressers of Sydney and it also has a street directories for Sydney. Now there's a similar publication called Wise's Post Office Commercial Directory available on Trove in the magazines and newsletter section. Now this actually goes longer than Sands which finishes in 1930 and this one goes into the 1940s and it includes again country towns so you can see the list of uh, the particularly that this one is mainly farmers and graziers but it does include some storekeepers in the town of Pearlwa which I'm probably mispronouncing and of course Crove has newspapers New South Wales government gazettes there are certain archives that collect company and business records these include the Noel Butlin archive at the Australian National University Canberra and the Melbourne University archives one of my personal favorite directories is Dunn's Gazette and this is also digitized on Trove in the magazines and newsletters section its byline says it contains information concerning bills of sale mortgages of livestock wool liens crop liens bankruptcies business changes and other items of commercial interest and it runs from 1909 to 1945 it includes information on companies changes to companies it includes hotel licenses one of my favorites are the bills of sales registered at the registrar general departments so here for example we have Frederick Betar is buying a motor car for the cost of 100 pounds and he's borrowed the money from W Berkmar and is paying it back at five pounds monthly Frederick Borrowdale is buying furniture for 24 pounds from R. H. Gordon and Company and is paying it back at 10 shillings weekly interestingly Travis Brett who is a warehouse manager has borrowed money from May G Brett so he can buy a piano furniture and a wireless set and that is 450 pounds worth and of course you get the ones like William H Boosfield who is a hotel keeper at casino who has borrowed 3000 pounds for furniture etc from Gwendolyn I Darley it may possibly even be a mortgage and that is also subject to a bill of sale to Tooth and Company Limited so Dunn's Gazette is well worth a look into now what about modern companies nowadays company regulation is the province of the federal government and it's the Australian Securities and Investment Commission who has that information so for modern companies go to AXIC thank you I hope this has expanded your ideas about where you can get some information on about companies and businesses and good luck in your research over to you Emily